Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in for our webinar, Driving Resilience, Mobilizing Finance for Climate and Biodiversity Amid Geopolitical Tensions. This event is a part of a six-part uh, series by SEI leading up to the COP this year. And our webinar will have, uh, first and foremost, very strongly European-centric focus. SEI has offices across the world, and we are covering all different geographical parts and aspects. With this seminar today, what we wanted to do is to bring together uh, different views from Europe. Uh, in a sense, Europe as a political entity, as a political union, Europe as a global actor working together with international partners, uh, being important driver in uh, uh, international environmental negotiations, and then Europe as an extended uh, entity and the issues uh, in uh, war in Ukraine and its impact on Eastern Partnership region and the outlook of extended Europe in the world. But our day today uh, we will have two hours to cover all those topics. We will start with opening remarks by our SEI Executive Director Mons Nielsen, and then we'll be having a uh, few presentations to get us into the topic. We will have a presentation from UNEP, uh, looking, uh, reflecting back on what has been achieved. Uh, uh, so far with the COPs and what can be expected uh, to come uh, this year and in the future. I will be also reflecting and bringing in a few insights from SEI research, but also weaving in research done by other organizations uh, as a setting for setting the scene. And then we will have uh, Jordanka Jordanov, uh, who is uh, Executive Director of Environmental Think Tank in Moldova, but also a former Minister of uh, Environment for Moldova, looking at the regional aspect, especially how uh, countries in extended Europe are feeling the same geopolitical impacts and how it's affecting their policy responses. And then we will have a, a panel discussion where, in addition to uh, Arnold Kreilhuber and Jordanka Jordano. We will have also Kate Bentus Rosimanos, who is currently a member of European Court of Auditors, and Helena Brown, who is uh, currently head of political team uh, of European representation in Estonia, uh, joining us to cover uh, all issues uh, that are related to these uh, aforementioned challenges. But I would now uh, extend very warm welcome to our executive director, uh, Dr. Mons Nielsen, who has a very long and extensive career in research and uh, consulting governments, consulting international uh, organizations on issues of sustainability um, and policy reforms. Mons, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lowry. <clears throat> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure and honor for me to open this seminar on mobilizing finance for climate and biodiversity amid geopolitical tensions. Indeed, the topic is covering some of the most pressing challenges in the green transition today. And first, of course, the climate change urgency and its economic and financial ramifications. I don't think I have to remind the audience of this, but just to note regarding the role of finance with the growing intensity of extreme weather events it's becoming clear that it's not only the net zero transition that's creating new opportunities and challenges for the economy and for business but also the direct and indirect impacts of climate change as well extreme weather events and damage caused by natural disasters totaled uh, three to four hundred billion us dollars in economic losses globally in 22 Less than a third of these losses were covered by insurance. We have prolonged droughts causing major economic damage, increasing the degradation of water resources. Not only people, but also our economic uh, actors and business rely on across agriculture, industry, energy, and river transportation, for example. 
and the insurance industry has predicted a staggering one trillion US dollar in losses due to climate change per year currently. The National Bureau of Economic Research in the United States have suggested the economic cost of climate change to be six times greater than previous estimates, forecasting a 12% decline in global GDP associated with a one degree increase in global temperature. So there are serious risks to specific sectors and regions, including in Europe, that increase the likelihood of systemic financial shock due to climate change. Furthermore, these kinds of impacts are not happening in a vacuum, but are likely to be amplified by non-climatic drivers and events, as we've already seen from the COVID pandemic, Russia's war in Ukraine, <clears throat> and the wars in Gaza and Lebanon currently. Over the last three decades, SEI has worked closely with intergovernmental organizations and national governments and other actors to identify and assess options and strategies for how to deal with these challenges, as well as challenges of nature and biodiversity loss and pollution of air, water and soil. Right now, we are concluding the five year strategy for 20 to 24, and we're opening a new chapter. The last five years have signified some new emphasis for SEI in line with three major trends. First, the business sector has been taking climate transitions to the core of their strategies. It's no longer an environmental management system a little bit on the side. The green transition is firmly in the boardrooms of all major companies. Second, the financial industry and the wider international financing system is following suit, albeit slowly, perhaps not leading the way always, as recent backsliding has suggested. And both of these trends have, of course, been driven largely by EU policy in particular, but also global commitments made on, on uh, the climate transition more generally. But thirdly, we have experienced this much worsening multilateral collaboration context with fragmentation of international affairs, a type of challenging of the rules-based order and really worsening relationships and polarization between the world's big powers, such as US and China. And the scaling of the climate solutions that are in place has also caused a lot of political and social backlash, not only when the old fossil system is kind of fighting back, but also that new stakeholders are being impacted. For example, local communities in areas where mining and wind power installations are being established. So these and other global trends have led us to reinvent global strategy for SEI for the coming years. Um, this is now first and foremost a strategy to build on our strength as a research institute, bridging science to policy and practice. But it's also making some adaptations to this changing world around us. And while the public launch will be later this year, I can share a few strands already now. First, Action on the ground is becoming urgent as emissions and nature loss keep going. We will put emphasis on research and knowledge support for implementation. No need to prioritize investing in endless debates and calculations about whether it should be 2050 or 2060 for net zero. We now need to act today to, to get moving. Secondly, the scaling of climate transition type technologies, batteries, electric vehicles, renewable power generation, bioeconomy solutions. These are causing knock on effects in supply chains and in local impacts. And this is opening new research domains for us. How to deal with the competition and conflict over land use, how to deal with minerals and mining, and how does the sustainability transition square with national security concerns? Common for these types of knowledge domains is that science does not have a uniform answer. There are multiple answers depending on what lens you adopt and from what angle you look at the problem. And what you, what you think about fundamental issues in international relations. For example, should we put our faith in China to supply the, the things we need for the green transition? Or do we think we should have a minimal dependency and exposure to China? There's no answer in science, but our research can illuminate pathways and the risks and vulnerabilities that are associated with each pathway and ultimately trade-offs. Building up a European resource base will slow down the adoption of new technologies, but it comes with other benefits. So finally, 
the political tensions from the local to the geopolitical require mediation and response. Science can be a diplomatic tool, perhaps one of the last ones in situations of international conflict. SEI will continue to play a role in the science policy interface in international diplomacy that can enable stakeholders to pursue dialogue and joint problem solving. So these are some of our ambitions in the new strategy that I think fit well with the topic of today's seminar. So now I look very much forward to following this. Uh, over to you, Lauri. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mons. Indeed, this was a great introduction to the day and a very good teaser for the wide audience of a new SEI strategy that will become publicly launched later on this year. But now I have absolute pleasure to hand over the floor to Arnold Kreilhuber, who is the regional director of uh, UNEP uh, uh, and, and has taken the lead of a Europe office uh, since last May last year. Arnold has very extensive professional experience in international environmental uh, diplomacy, policy and law. He has a doctorate degree in, uh, in international law from the University of Vienna. And I will now hand the floor over to you to guide us into what can we expect from the COP29 uh, and COP16. Um, please. Thank you very much, uh, Lauri. And uh, thank you also, Mons and colleagues at the Stockholm Environment Institute for the invitation to this important uh, webinar. It's a real pleasure to be with you all today and uh, be part of this uh, webinar on behalf of UNEP. Where do we find ourselves uh, as we head into COP29 in Baku in a few weeks, uh, but also COP16 in Cali in Colombia? even uh, before COP29 is when we will have COP16. And um, there are good news and bad news. The good news are that uh, the COP28 uh, on climate change that took place uh, last year delivered a historic first. It delivered a clear call on countries to transition away from fossil fuels. This commitment uh, represents a significant step in addressing the climate uh, crisis. The agreement coming out of COP29 also included a pledge to triple the investments in renewable energy. And Mons has already mentioned to us how important these investments are. They are crucial if we want to keep the global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees. At COP28, progress has also been made on various other fronts. For example, new pledges were made by 27 countries to reduce emissions from buildings, 60 countries joined pledges on the cooling industry and fighting methane emissions. Significant discussions were also held on food systems and their environmental impact. COP28 marked a clear global recognition of the harmful impact of fossil fuels and the commitment to moving towards renewable energy. Since COP28, the world no longer denies our harmful addiction to fossil fuels. And as the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, has said, their phase out is inevitable. Meanwhile, COP15 under the Convention on Biological Diversity also presented us with a historic result, the so-called Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. This framework has been compared to the Paris Agreement on Climate Change because of its comparable ambitious global targets. One of these targets is the so-called 30 by 30 target, which aims to conserve 30% of the world's land and ocean by 2030, as well as restore 30% of degraded ecosystems. The final agreement reached at COP15 includes concrete measures to halt and reverse nature loss. These include putting, as I have said, 30% of the planet and 30% of degraded ecosystems under protection by 2030. It also contains proposals to increase finance to developing countries, which had been a major sticking point during the calls. Significant countries agreed to mobilize at least 200 billion per the year 2030 to fund biodiversity projects, with a specific target of 20 billion per year by 2025 for financial flows to developing countries, and this should rise to 30 billion per year by 2030. 
Countries furthermore approved a series of related agreements to implement the global biodiversity framework, including on planning, monitoring, reporting and review, which are all vital to ensure progress is made. And in also learning from the Aichi biodiversity targets, which the global biodiversity framework now replaces. The aim is to ensure that there is not a further acceleration in the global rate of species extinction, which is very, very alarming. At least tens to hundreds of times higher than it has averaged over the past 10 million years is this rate current. The Mon Kunming Montreal Protocol, um, uh, Kunming Montreal Agreement also recognized the rights and roles of indigenous peoples and local communities in biodiversity conservation coming on the heels of the universal recognition by the General Assembly of the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. From the Amazon rainforest to the Caspian Sea, these communities and stakeholders are the key stewards of the biodiversity that keeps the Earth's hearts beating. We therefore, with the Kunming Montreal Agreement, we have a global plan to repair the web that sustains all life on Earth, and significant targets have been set to finance it. These are historic steps. Yet despite this, more efforts are needed if we are to be on track to truly deliver a resilient, low-carbon world where we heal and sustain this web of life. With regards to climate change, and now I'm moving into the not-so-good news, the reality has been outlined in UNEP's last emissions gap report which we regularly release ahead of the climate COPs. And uh, the latest report has shown that we are not on track to, to keep the global temperature rise down to internationally agreed levels. We need continued action and ambition. We must address the gaps in the current climate commitments and especially for major emitters. The last COP, COP28, marked an important milestone, but we need even stronger efforts going forward. And particularly, as UNEP has highlighted, we need more action and more investments into key sectors to reduce emissions that would allow the world to stay below the 1.5 degree mark. And if we do that, it is possible that we cut 30 gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions annually by 2030 and that we stay below 1.5 degrees. These investments need to uh, uh, occur in the fields of agriculture and food, buildings, cities and construction, energy, transport, industry, forest and land use. And this is the scene that has been set for COP29 in Baku in Azerbaijan in a few weeks, which will focus on setting the scene for countries to come to terms with new enhanced nationally determined contributions, or NDCs as they're called, which need to be submitted by early 2025. And it also aims to enhance transparency efforts in line with the first upcoming submissions of the biennial transparency reports. And most importantly, perhaps it will need to deliver on a new quantified goal on climate finance in order to replace the goal by 2020 that was agreed in 2009, in order to help developing countries to mitigate and adapt to climate change. We must mainstream climate action into policy making at all levels of planning, including in investments. And we must embrace the nature-based solutions that act as carbon sinks and buffers against climate impacts. In order to do that, we need to shift our economies towards that green transition that has already been mentioned. Meanwhile, with regards to biodiversity, we need to move from commitments to implementation. We have a very ambitious global biodiversity framework that will address the most pressing needs that preserving conservation of biodiversity presents to us currently. And we need to see progress among other things in Kali, how we turn this framework into tangible action, strengthen resource mobilization, and ensure the financial mechanism is ready for implementation. Again, this is especially crucial for developing nations. As we have seen 
finance targets being set before for climate change and the struggles to get the flows up to an adequate level, we must now move at the same or, or we must move at an increased pace for biodiversity. We do not have the luxury to wait. If we want to meet the global sustainability challenges, we need also the support of the private sector. If there is one lesson from the past negotiations, the past agreements, the past targets that have been set, is that there is not enough public money to finance the massive structural changes our societies desperately need, including for biodiversity. And finally, let me also mention COP16 under the UN Convention to Combat Desertification will take place also later this year in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. And uh, its focus will be on how can we achieve land degradation neutrality by 2030. This means integrating this commitment into national development plans, restoring degraded lands and bringing the land agenda more concretely into the three Rio conventions for accelerated integrated progress. The UN conferences on biodiversity, climate and land will take place in quick succession between October and December. Climate change, biodiversity loss and land degradation are different expressions of one planetary crisis, but they are also highly interrelated and they react to one another. And that re represents a great opportunity because action in one has positive effects in the others. We often hear of tipping points in a negative sense. In 2024, we have a chance to trigger positive tipping points. We have a chance to make real progress at these upcoming conferences. Climate change is not just about carbon emissions. Biodiversity is not just about endangered species. And as I have said, progress in one field will spur progress in another and ultimately make all of our lives better. Of course, and this is also the topic of this, uh, of this webinar, these conversations take place in a difficult geopolitical climate. However, as also the recent adoption of the Pact for the Future in New York during the Summit of the Future has shown, there is no alternative to multilateralism. And the Pact for the Future presents a reinvigoration of this sentiment and one that hopefully can be carried forward to these important negotiations over the next few weeks. Let me finally say that we have the solutions. We know what needs to be done. We have taken important steps, but greater ambition, greater focus and further action cannot wait. Thank you very much and I look forward to the discussions during this webinar. Back over to you, Lali. Thank you so much. This is a great setting of a scene for a whole event for us, and indeed a very good reminder that there is no alternative to the multilateralism. And, and during the harder times, we need to find ways, and as Mons was saying, science can be sometimes the mediator uh, in those conflicts and tensions. Okay, but now I will also uh, share with you a few insights based on uh, the research that we ourselves from SCI side have done uh, and a few parts also from our organizations. Let's see if it works. So, what does the science say about climate and biodiversity? Very importantly, uh, in 2021, there was a, a co-sponsored workshop bringing together two very important international bodies, IPCC and IPPS, and, and linking and delivering a very authoritative uh, take on showing the interlinkages between uh, uh, climate and biodiversity issues, as Arnold was also explaining. Uh, and what's the very, very important uh, simple takeaway is that there cannot be 
climate policy that doesn't respect and uh, take into account the biodiversity aspects and also biodiversity policies can and should have synergistic uh, effects with climate policies. That is the only way really that we can make substantive uh, progress going forward. And it's also very important that uh, it can have both negative feedback loops or positive feedback loops. And obviously our policy responses and all the work that we do jointly should focus on creating this positive feedback. A simple example of the interlinkages. We are currently from SCI Italian, for example, working together with the different communities in Estonia. We are building a extensive weather sensor network and we are providing the local municipalities insights of how on, on a data-based uh, approach they can have much more targeted, much more effective and smart uh, uh, policies to build resilience, be more uh, uh, effective in the adaptation policies and urban planning really also and reducing the negative health effects that the urban heat islands can have on the elderly and vulnerable groups. So these are the, also the projects that show us why the heat islands and these positive effects of greenery, it's not a news, it's not a, um, you know, unknown, but however, what we see in working with those communities that they need to experience and get the information that is their specific uh, and be part of discussing the solutions. And that is probably the lesson learned that we see in our operations and research across all over the world in SEI that, that even though we know what's right and what needs to be done, still people need to have context, region, location specific information and they need to be part of the solutions. Also, our colleagues have done extensive work uh, in identifying uh, also that, that our consumption patterns and the supply chains have massive effect, massive effect on biodiversity and massive climate implications. So if we talk about actual substantive progress in terms of uh, going forward, then in exporting the pollution or exporting the negative uh, uh, environmental impact uh, and, and let's say European policies that would be directed only that we don't have uh, pollution or environmental impact in Europe, but we export it, is not okay because that's not an actual progress. Our research has shown that, for example, Swedish consumption, almost 70% of the negative environmental impact is through the imported goods. So the most of Swedish, let's say, environmental footprint comes from the consumption and imports, and, and we need to tackle and build policies that address that. Also what we see uh, in our research that the colleagues are doing uh, with the coastal communities is, is that, that many of the policies are very land focused, but whatever we do uh, uh, on the land finally ends up through the rivers, through the water systems, into the oceans, into the seas, and, and that is a very big uh, intersection where different uh, forces like the climate change, uh, pollution and, and then the biodiversity impacts like overfishing meet and, and create again kind of these negative loops. So, so we need to actually have better policies uh, that uh, address that issue. Also Mons was mentioning the unlocking of the potential of bioeconomy. Our colleagues are working in Latin America, for example, and Asia and Africa are seeing that we could have transformative policies in place that could create, instead of negative force and impacts of the bio uh, resource use, smart and more sustainable uh, solutions uh, that will help us both preserve better biodiversity, but also uh, reach the climate goals that we need. Very importantly also what we see from SCI research, we have many colleagues working on cross-border uh, climate risks and last year there was a major 
joint report by several research organizations and think tanks, and we were one of the co-authors there, that climate risks, they don't stop at the borders. What we see through the ecosystems, through the trade links, through finance, through human mobility, these risks are spilling all over the world, uh, across all the borders, and they are triggering different uh, uh, crises, for example, food and energy insecurity. And what is also important from the research, we can see that they will have the biggest impact on the poorest and most vulnerable groups. So, so this clearly says that if the risks don't stop at the borders, also the solutions cannot stop at the borders, which means country-based approaches, they are good for certain uh, adap adapting and dealing with certain risks, but many of the risks are the ones that require regional, global responses and uh, better policies for, in that regard. So again, it only emphasized the same point uh, that Arnold was saying, that we, we need to have the joint solutions. But where are we now? Indeed, there was a major, major breakthrough uh, uh, in the last COP and, and very important agreements, but as, as every year different organizations are publishing uh, then leading up to the COP, how are we doing? And uh, IRENA, uh, International Renewable Energy Agency, just very recently also published their assessment of how we are progressing. And, and what is worrying is that even though we had record growth of renewables, we had record investments into the renewables, it is still uh, current plans are only delivering half of the required growth in renewable power. And similarly, energy efficiency, energy saving measures are way, way behind uh, of the required. Uh, IRENA says that they need to increase sevenfold to reach uh, the target that w uh, we set last time. So, so this means that this is, there's a significant gap still uh, in terms of investment, and that is why we want to discuss later in the panel as well how can we accelerate and, and speed up these uh, investments. And if we are seeing the progress and have uh, positive or encouraging news in terms of investment growth, then we are much further uh, on falling behind on delivering on biodiversity promises. Uh, WWF uh, also published a kind of stock taking on, on, on the national biodiversity plans, and it seems that only 10 percent of the countries have submitted concrete national plan and uh, that is updated and you know pushing forward and in compliance with obligations and only a third of the countries have uh, national targets which are at least a step forward compared to not having ones so this is this is clearly not good enough I would say So what is the cost of inaction? As Mons was bringing out, the cost of inaction is already huge. And, and it is putting economic toll on communities, on households, on companies across the world. And what is obviously worrisome is that we know that we are on, already on a track and on a pathway that these costs will go up in the uh, coming years. And also, uh, what is an important cost of uh, the inaction is that also the adaptation costs will increase. Not only the direct negative impacts from those uh, extreme weather events, but, but the adaptation needs. And this is what we see that if we talked about uh, mitigation, investment needs, then adaptation is catching up 
in terms of needs very fast. And, and the slower we are with mitigation, the more we need to put uh, uh, investments into adaptation. That is the sad reality. And if we talk about uh, uh, recent years and the uh, war in Ukraine and the conflict and the geopolitical tensions, then also the underinvestment in the renewables and continuation of using fossil fuels, what it meant for Europe was actually a significant cost. Governments were putting uh, a lot of funding, which they perhaps didn't have, and, and was putting pressure on the public finances. More than 500 billion euros were uh, put forward as subsidies towards households and companies in Europe, uh, which is gigantic. If you think what could have been done with that 500 Euro, uh, billion euros in terms of uh, stimulating investments into renewable energy. You could have built and transformed uh, large-scale energy systems with uh, these kind of funding, but it went into paying subsidies. So, so and, and uh, obviously the, we are talking here about financial burden, but the heaviest burden for what we see is, is Ukraine paying still on our reliance and, and dependence with lives every day as the conflict goes on. I'm having slight difficulties. Okay, it's moving. So what could be done to accelerate the implementation? I wanted to share uh, an example uh, of a study that we from SCI tell indeed a few years ago uh, on a reaching climate neutrality in Estonia. There was a huge expectations for the study because there was a public uh, worry about you know what does it mean is it doable at all so so what we were expected to provide evidence base was is going to net zero climate neutrality doable at all and what kind of measures are uh, needed for that, and what will be the costs and economic impacts associated with that transition. So what we did, we built uh, a model and, and we analyzed possible 60 possible policy intervention measures and showed what would be the capital costs, operating costs, what would be the socioeconomic impacts, uh, and altogether built a scenario for the government showing the pathway. And what was important was that we said to the government, yes, climate neutrality is doable. It will require 17 billion euros, give or take, over 30 years. But what is important, it's manageable because it's less than 3% of the GDP. And even more so, what is important, that this 17 billion euros would not be a cost. It's an investment that will bring economic savings and boost jobs in Estonia. And Coming now also to the issue that are not touched upon, yes, the governments are uh, pressed uh, in terms of financing capacity all over the world, but what our study in Estonia showed that most of the investments actually need to come from private sector, meaning households and companies. So this was also a very important message for the government that no, you don't need to finance everything, but what you need to do Is, is to create uh, conditions for those investments. They will not magically just appear and happen, but you need to remove administrative regulatory barriers, you need to create stimulating investment environment, and you need to ensure that you have skills and competencies, invest into people who will make these projects actually work. So this was an important uh, message for the government. And what we saw was that it gave the confidence for Estonian government to support the climate neutrality goal. And what we have seen ever since is actually increasing. The next governments and cabinets that Estonia had have increased and, and built on that confidence that it's actually doable and beneficial. And uh, we've seen 
reduction in red tape in planning, we've seen new investments into greed, we've seen new uh, uh, renewable energy auctions, we've seen also government put together and adopt holistic green transition plan, taking into account not only the energy and climate part, but also the, the green part uh, uh, in compliance with the EU Green Deal. So while also Estonia is not on track, we can see that these kind of tools can help sometimes to lever and give confidence and guidance to the governments to speed up uh, their actions. But obviously, uh, Estonia had a lot already in terms of institutional capacity, legislative framework, in terms of access to capital existing. These kind of making these kind of investments happen in a low income countries are significantly trickier. Our colleagues have been researching, for example, energy transitions in sub Saharan Africa. If you have governments who are defaulting, if you have utilities whose tariffs are not covering any investments or they have customers paying, not paying the bills, they cannot service the loans, uh, then all the demand and the projects are significantly smaller than a grid scale, then creating these kind of investment conditions is significantly harder, obviously. And that is why also uh, our colleagues working in climate finance are emphasizing that actually the countries in uh, Global South will need very strong uh, cooperation and contribution for regions like Europe and other uh, developed countries uh, in helping them to make the transitions, making the finance available. Because with their own uh, mobilization capacity, with their own technical or competence capacities, they are not able to do that. So a new climate finance goal is really vital for keeping uh, uh, climate change at manageable levels and halting the land change use. And that is why the upcoming COP is very important in that uh, sense. And lastly, I wanted to share that based and inspired and, and building upon the, what we've learned in Estonia, also there's a major CEDA funded uh, project that we are working together with our uh, headquarter colleagues from Stockholm in supporting the green transition in Ukraine, Moldova, Armenia and Georgia. And, and what we are doing there is helping to assess where they are in terms of the policies, uh, identifying the uh, uh, bottlenecks and the gaps, uh, and then co-creating uh, roadmaps and implementation plans to address those weaknesses, to build the conditions that the change can happen and that they can mobilize the finance because there's a huge political interest to support those countries now, but we also need a, a good strategy. Where does the money bring the biggest value well, and, and create conditions for that? And we are supporting that study by doing similar climate neutrality modeling also for those countries so that governments, if they go to their uh, citizens, if they speak to their partners, they have the evidence and they have the tools that they know where to begin with. But obviously, research and modeling, it can give you tools in the way forward, but it will not replace political courage and commitment. So we need uh, still people, at least for the uh, few, few years, I think, before the AI revolution finally takes over. We need people with courage and commitment to make these things happen. We need people to collaborate. We need people to discuss and share and find solutions. Thank you. And with that, I would now like to give the floor to uh, to our next speaker, uh, Jordanka Jordanova. Uh, she is uh, currently the executive director of EcoContact, 
But as I was mentioning, she also uh, was uh, during the hardest times, uh, during the uh, energy crisis uh, and the war in Ukraine launching, she was the Minister of Environment in Moldova. And I've invited her to share uh, and reflect on how Moldova sees the current ge geopolitical challenges and what is your response and thinking in terms of how to respond it at the national level, but also at the international level. Yordanko, please. Thanks a lot and uh, thank you to all of you for offering the possibility to speak in this uh, webinar. And uh, thank you, Lauri, for uh, mentioning that uh, uh, I took uh, the responsibility to be in front of the Minister of Environment in the Republic of Moldova in the most complicated period. Uh, indeed, the war in uh, Ukraine and uh, also the energy crisis which affected Moldova created a lot of uh, uh, discussions, a lot of conflicts, a lot of debates. And uh, I think uh, we had uh, some experience and some lessons learned from uh, that period. So. Anyway, uh, I would like to discuss with you regarding the regional opportunities and challenges, enhancing environmental policies, balancing climate and biodiversity related to the efforts in a time of conflict. So I, uh, I will support the ideas which was mentioned by my colleagues previously. And I would like just to mention several of examples and uh, uh, steps which uh, Moldova is uh, taking uh, now as a country with uh, a statute of a candidate to the European Union and also which is uh, enhancing a lot of uh, challenges, a lot of uh, actions and uh, a lot of uh, um, discussions related to the, uh, how to speed up uh, how to uh, emphasize all the problems and also how to uh, su uh, successfully uh, to uh, pass all this uh, period, which is uh, not easy at all. So uh, uh, I would like to start my presentation with uh, just mentioning a few of the... Uh, sorry, I just would like to change. Okay, so I would like to uh, start my presentation with several of uh, um, issues which we underline uh, analyzing the geopolitical uh, situation in the region and especially we already uh, saw and uh, uh, based on the different uh, documentary uh, movies and also visiting uh, Ukraine during the war, that uh, war in Ukraine has a big impact uh, on the human life, on the dignity, on the social and infrastructure situation, also um, which is uh, very newly uh, recognized based on the uh, war which is uh, uh, ongoing in Ukraine, the impact on environmental degradation, deforestation, the pollution of uh, water, air, soil, it's indeed already documented by the colleagues from Ukraine and we are expecting that uh, a lot of uh, data, a lot of uh, cases will be launched for, uh, for uh, this period. But uh, regional instability also has a lot of impact on uh, the other countries. So in the conflict or post-conflict zones, governments tend to prioritize security, military spending and immediate humanitarian relief or the long-term environmental initiatives. And this is the reality and uh, uh, we already saw uh, several of such kinds of examples. For example, the project on the reforestation and the renewable energy develops may be delay as a focus shifting to restoring damaged facilities or providing basic needs to displace population. So these uh, kinds of examples are, are already in place. So, uh, and for sure, the processes will be longer than we expected. Also, another big impact uh, which was already realized is the fact that the international uh, financial aid and investments meant for climate actions can be rechanneled to conflict resolutions or post-conflict recovery. 
uh, a lot of uh, climate funds which was expected uh, for this period uh, are already redirected to more urgent needs and this is clear why such kind of redirection exists and also the resulting in the setbacks uh, to achieving climate neutrality and biodiversity conservation targets also could be delayed another uh, impact which we uh, realized uh, in the period of conflict is the fact that uh, conflicts often lead to the direct destru uh, destruction of the natural habitats such as forests and wetlands uh, and uh, through the military operation or because of displaced population uh, a lot of uh, natural resources are uh, severe explored and uh, used so uh, for example, uh, deforestation for the firewood or uh, extensive agriculture. All these uh, lost or biodiversity and the times ecosystem that uh, play a critical role in, in carbon se uh, sequestration, water regulation and overall climate resilience. So uh, it is true that neglecting the environmental protection during the conflict lead to the breakdown of government governance structures, meaning that protected areas and conservation programs are often neglected or abandoned. So this is one of the uh, reality. And this uh, such kind of reality means that uh, uh, it's necessary to keep eyes on the situation. It's necessary to reallocate the finance and it's necessary to keep uh, the progress in development uh, uh, way is possible during the war and for sure after the war will be uh, finalized. And uh, unfortunately, also the environmental diplomatical relations could be affected. You know very well that uh, uh, a lot of countries, uh, they have common ecosystem, common ecosystem on the borders. And it's very important to have the understandable and very proactive diplomatical relation, especially during uh, the last uh, years. Unfortunately, uh, the war can affect such kind of relations and because uh, it, a lot of efforts are dedicated to the solving the, the environmental, uh, uh, solving the uh, war conflict. What is uh, important in uh, this period also is to uh, identify what kind of uh, um, response countries can have. If to use as example Republic of Moldova, for Moldova it is now a, it's a, now a priority to find the balancing environmental prior, priorities in all this uh, geopolitical stress. And it's very important that uh, Moldova will make these uh, uh, challenges such as uh, energy insecurity, economical uh, uh, disruption and uh, limited financial capacity capacity for climate initiatives. Uh, all were sent by regional instability. So it is important for, now, for us to have the capacity to develop and make uh, and to be um, prepared uh, to make face on such kind of uh, uh, challenges. Uh, Moldova has also a big pressure at this moment. You know that uh, Moldova uh, from 2022 has the statute of uh, candidate country for European Union. This is not an easy path, uh, especially on environmental issue. And on environmental issue, I'm speaking also about climate and biodiversity components. So it's not an easy uh, way at all. But uh, from another point of view, this uh, uh, path will make us uh, more uh, mobilized and more proactive in conducting different reforms also at uh, policy level and also at the institutional levels and it will be necessary to reorganize the financial system and technical uh, support from uh, technical and financial support from donors will be very much useful in this uh, um, period
But it's also very important to understand that uh, uh, the environmental development in the country, in the country which on the border had, uh, has, uh, has the war, to keep the balance between the economical development and also the balance with the environmental recovery and the environmental responsibilities. So uh, it is quite important at this uh, moment to have the strategic uh, alignment with the uh, European uh, Green Deal and to push for sustainable energy transition uh, offer Moldova, that will offer Mold to Moldova the opportunities to advance despite geopolitical challenges. So, um, if to speak about uh, the regional pressure and Moldova, Moldovan development, I would like to uh, mentioned that for us the energy security it as it is element of stability and sustainability so moldova it's at this moment uh, uh, is doing a lot to uh, lose this uh, energy dependency of uh, fossil fuels due to the uh, political and the geopolitical pressure and in this case we are seeing the opportunity for us to invest in uh, renewable energy and uh, building a climate resilience uh, community. I have a problem with uh, uh, changing the slides. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, I think I... Uh, okay, so... Uh, uh, for us, it's very important to have these uh, clear investments in the, the energy and uh, building uh, climate resilience. In connecting with our, our discussions, climate change and biodiversity during the crisis, uh, we uh, understand very well that uh, uh, all these crises uh, create a lot of uh, problems, uh, first of all, as uh, uh, raising the temperature, uh, a lot of uh, habitats are uh, destroyed and uh, uh, changing the ecosystem are already in place and we uh, see them uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, we, we need to identify solution for uh, recover or to mitigate such kind of situations. So uh, we we see that it is quite important at this moment to have uh, different programs on uh, forestation or afforestation, one recovery of the wetlands or other uh, ecosystems. And also it's very important for us to identify the system of carbon uh, sinks and to do a lot activities and measures in decarbonizations. So it is necessary for Republic of Moldova to do uh, and to be focused at this moment on the uh, nature-based solutions. So uh, it is uh, uh, also it is an issue that uh, a lot of uh, projects uh, are now in the process of uh, being developed and uh, to start recovery of the forest and uh, wetlands and uh, water ecosystems based on nature-based solutions. And it's not an easy way, but it and uh, all of us we understand that this is from one way and it is a long way but it's uh, possible to address through such kind of uh, project uh, the uh, issues regarding the uh, necessity of uh, ensuring the uh, habitats for uh, wildlife and also recovering the nature but in the same uh, time to have a strong uh, uh, commitment for countries development and to ensure the resilience communities we also would like to mention that uh, in uh, uh, during the COP27 just a small uh, historical uh, steps uh, uh, a lot of uh, from uh, a lot of activities or a lot of discussions were around uh, the uh, necessity that it's ne it's the time to act, it's a time to uh, be more proactive in the field of climate change and uh, also to find the most resilience building activities uh, and also to be focused on innovation. But also one of innovation in this field was uh, the financials, financial solutions and the way how uh, financial flow could uh, be covered uh, and could be uh, disbursed or how could be collected, taking in consideration all 
the uh, elements or the uh, nature. So also during the uh, COP28, which took place in Dubai, uh, a lot of discussions was how we can achieve the, the Paris Agreement and focus on uh, the challenges. So lost, lost and damages issues are very important and we exactly in the uh, period where such kind of activities uh, are necessary to be implemented. Uh, so. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, I, I will try to finalize my uh, uh, presentation in a few minutes. Uh, what, what, uh, uh, can, we, uh, can you move to the present, change the slide? So, uh, uh, the next one, just, uh, just I would like to mention a few words uh, regarding the ambitions of the uh, Republic of Moldova uh, related to climate and biodiversity. And and uh, this is uh, related especially uh, to the um, uh, fact that uh, Moldova is indeed it's limited to financial capacity in geopolitical instability. But this will create the possibility for us uh, to be uh, to develop our capacity because uh, Moldova is one of the most vulnerable climate uh, uh, affected uh, country in Europe. So uh, it is important for us to be strongly and vocal uh, and to be uh, to have a possibility to express our position and advocate for stronger regional policies by emphasizing the importance of uh, resilience build and adaptation. So this is one of the issues which will uh, create our ambitions for the next period. And also we uh, uh, we're looking for the tailored financial mechanism, especially such as loss and damages uh, funds, and to be part of this uh, process and uh, to express our position and also to highlight the need for ecosystem protection as part of the region's security and development strategies. Moldova as a vulnerable country, which I already mentioned, should be active, participated in the regional coalition, for example, to keep the active participation in the Eastern Partnership and to shape climate financial allocation, demand technological support and advocate for nature-based solutions in uh, such kind on, of uh, partnership and also to develop uh, the mechanisms in where we can uh, have a strong support and to ensure the security in the region. So, uh, unfortunately, it's uh, quite complicated to move the slides. Uh, yes, the next one. And uh, as a key, uh, uh, key elements, uh, and I will close here, is the fact that uh, Moldova will uh, uh, need to work on uh, rehabilitation of the protected areas and it's necessary to understand that this is uh, not just an ambition connected with the European integration but this is a necessity for us and it is necessary to integrate the biodiversity uh, uh, elements in the policy documents and to ensure that the climate financing addressing ecosystem uh, ecosystem recovery uh, it's uh, alongside human needs so it, or everything which is connected with the uh, environment uh, climate and biodiversity it's connected with the uh, human needs and human development uh, regarding the aspiration on climate mitigation although it's in the process now on uh, um, a revision of the national determinant contribution. We have very ambitious uh, approach in the national and on in NDCs, uh, and I am really uh, very uh, expecting to see the results of this uh, revision. And I really hope that we will keep uh, the level of ambitions in the climate neutrality and uh, uh, in the decarbonization of the country. Uh, regarding the war in uh, Ukraine. For us, it's very important uh, 
when the process of the recovery of Ukraine will start, should be taking in consideration two main elements on for this recovery, for the recovery process. First of all, the regional approach, because uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, the war affect uh, also Moldova, and uh, unfortunately the pollution from the war and the destruction destroyed uh, the environment destroyed by uh, war is not uh, stopped on the border between Moldova and uh, Ukraine or Moldova uh, or Ukraine Romania Ukraine uh, Poland but it spread uh, in the region so it's very important that uh, the recovery of Ukraine will start on the re- will take in consideration uh, consideration the regional approach and the green approach or environmental approach because the environmental approach in the recovery will mean the sustainability and to ensure that we will keep uh, eyes on the recovery, on the conservation, and we will ensure that uh, the process will be more sustainable for the future. So, uh, and it's necessary at this moment to have clear prioritization of uh, renewable energy, biodiversity conservation, and uh, in this case, Moldova will make the uh, significant progress. Uh, I think Moldova can be a lead on the resilience and climate adaptation, and Moldova can be uh, advocating for strong biodiversity safeguards in uh, the region and also at the global forest. So, at least, it's necessary to work and to have supporters and also to be uh, louder at the international events. So uh, I think we can continue uh, the discussion during the panel discussion. Uh, so thanks a lot for your uh, uh, part. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. And and having been uh, now to Moldova several times and Ukraine, there's indeed tremendous dynamism and desire and want to make change. and and integrate uh, to Europe and build build better policies for the future. But time is running fast, so let's move on now to the panel discussion. Uh, we will have four panelists uh, joining us. And could we have on the screen then the panelists? OK. And I have introduced Arnold, I have introduced Jordanka, uh, but I'm doing also an uh, introduction now to Kate Pentus Rosimanos, who is a member of the European Court of Auditors. Uh, and we've invited her because the uh, European Court of Auditors has done several uh, audits and has analyzed very closely of. Uh, how the European policies are working or not working, and financing working or not working. But also, I'm really hoping that Kate will bring her experience, actually, as a former Minister of Environment, Minister of Finance, and Minister of Foreign Affairs, having that multiple backgrounds into the discussions that we have. And then I'm also welcoming Helena Brown here, who is uh, uh, leading the political team at the European Commission representation in Estonia. But for many, many years, she worked in in Brussels and she worked there in uh, Vice President Timmermans' uh, cabinet, actually. And Helena was indeed uh, responsible at the highest uh, level, coordinating and negotiating all the Green Deal key policies, especially on biodiversity and adaptation and the international side. So hopefully she will bring these insights into the discussion as well. But coming back uh, to your presentation, uh, Arnold, I would, I would start with you. You were mentioning that indeed there have been historical uh, progress uh, and uh, agreements made, but at the other hand, if we take stock, how fast are we implementing these uh, policies? We see almost every year that the gap is not closing. We are not closing that gap, or even it's getting wider between uh, what's needed and where we are. So, so what's your feeling or what's your take? Why are we failing to close that gap? How can, how, how can COP start working better? How can we get more out of these negotiations? What needs to be changed? in order to change the dynamics? 
Yeah, thank you, Lowry, and uh, a great pleasure to be on this panel with uh, with so many great other uh, panelists. Uh, it is um, it is a, a loaded question in many ways, uh, Lowry, right? Because we're approaching COP twenty nine, right? This is not COP one, two, three, or five. Uh, it is COP twenty nine. Right, and um, one could argue that we've known for a long time uh, what the problem is, and we've known for a long time what we should do. So I think the first point that I would like to highlight is again that we do not have, speaking about gaps, we do not have a knowledge gap. What we have is an action gap. And um, Speaking about action, I think it's it's still important, despite all these messages, that we still have gaps in action, implementation, financing, that we that we celebrate uh, the progress that has been made. That I also highlighted in my in my opening remarks. Without the Paris Agreement uh, of 2015 and the actions that uh, countries have taken under it, we would be much worse off. Right. So despite um, perhaps the sentiment that not enough has been done, I think we should, uh, we should still celebrate the actions that have been taken and build on them. In that context, the road to COP30, for which of course COP29 is also a very important one, offers a great opportunity because uh, by 2025 countries need to submit their new nationally determined uh, contributions. An analysis of the current NDCs have shown that they will not help us, even if they're fully implemented, to meet the 1.5 degrees. So this next generation of NDCs needs to be much more targeted, needs to be much more ambitions, uh, ambitious, and countries have that opportunity to do that. Um, one could also be even more alarmist if uh, if you think about heat waves that we've also seen uh, during this summer in Europe, uh, that uh, the period between February 2023 to January 2024, um, yes, boosted by uh, El Nino, uh, was the first 12-month period uh, globally that has exceeded the 1.5 degrees. But of course, the goals of the 1.5 degrees are broader, they are more long term. So uh, despite, uh, you know, these these uh, alarming reminders, I think we should not lose focus uh, and we should stick to really, uh, you know, getting uh, getting meaningful action uh, on the way to stick to the 1.5 uh, degrees, even if at times, if you, uh, you know, look at the data, look at the science, it may seem like a lost cause, but as, a, as I have also said in my opening remarks, if we invest uh, just in these six you know, key uh, sectors of our economic activity, we can in all likelihood make uh, very, very meaningful steps towards 1.5 degrees by 2030. Again, it needs the action. It needs really this transformation of our economic uh, system, which has had a lot of benefits uh, over over the past uh, uh, decades. It has brought um, you know economic development to many people, to many countries, to many communities. But it has you know reached its limits, and we need to move to a more circular system of uh, of our economic uh, activities. Every fraction of a degree matters, and um, I have mentioned uh, that uh, one of the key gaps is financial, that we really need to look at financing um, over the next, uh, over the next uh, few COPs, uh, both in the area of climate change, but also biodiversity. I've mentioned uh, already for COP29, uh, the goal is to set a new financing target uh, to replace the 100 billion that were set in 2009 by 2020. Not only did the international community miss this target by two years, but it's also now very evident that 100 billion uh, USD is nowhere near uh, sufficient. In uh, terms of closing the biodiversity finance gap, we would need 700 
billion a year by 2030 to fully implement the, the GBF. So the numbers are big, but they offer also an opportunity, as I have said, to make these transitions, to not only think in, in the niche of biodiversity or climate, but really think you know, economic prosperity, think uh, new jobs, think uh, improved quality of life uh, for people around, around the world. So what I think we need to improve on is to present environmental action increasingly as a business case. And uh, many, uh, many uh, business actors are taking this on actively, but I think we need to bring them in uh, much more into this discussion because with the public sector alone, we will probably not be able to do it. Let me finally, uh, Lowry, uh, say maybe a quick word about, about the COPs. Um, I don't think the COPs are the problem um, because the COPs, uh, uh, you know, present us with uh, the scenario. Uh, they, they establish a process and a roadmap. The problem, again, is I think the lacking determination uh, to act urgently and uh, perhaps that we have, despite the many COPs, not succeeded in making these issues uh, whole of society issues, right? They are um, also, if you look at, uh, you know, political discussions in, in this region, often these discussions are still very sectoral and it's very easy then to pit one actor against the other. I think um, science, the data, the gaps that we still have, show us that uh, we need to really have a whole society approach from here on out. It can be done. Uh, often, of course, the, Mont uh, the, the Montreal Protocol is listed as an example, right? Um, but the lessons from there in, uh, in fixing the ozone layer are also that, uh, you know, the key actors were part of the solution early on. And I think uh, if we want to be somewhat self-critical, this is maybe something that we that we have not done to the extent needed. And uh, that clearly needs to happen um, through COP29, COP30, and uh, also the biodiversity-related negotiations over the next few years. OK. Thank you so much. I, I will jump from here to Helena, to you, actually. Because if, if COP delivers results, and, and then the issue is the implementation, then you know, you were at the, at the really at the epicenter of the negotiations of the Green Deal, and and the EU. If we look back, historically played a major part in global international uh, climate environmental policies. President von der Leyen. I mean, the Green Deal was her main driver and, and pillar. Uh, but we've seen also quite a lot of public debate and backlash, uh, and and some of the pillars. Uh, like uh, Anna was saying, we need to make it whole of society issue. You know, it seems getting the whole of society uh, on board with the Green Deal has been challenging, to say the least, because, you know, last week's Guardian opinion piece was saying uh, that Europe was a leader on saving nature. Now it's backsliding, could threaten global progress. Do you, do you agree with this assessment or what's, what's, what's your take? Uh, how successful has been uh, Europe in making it a whole society issue and green transformation, not only a carbon tunnel issue of, of energy transformation, but wider climate and biodiversity? Where do you see Europe kind of progressing fast? Where do you see Europe lagging behind? And, and based on that, can we go to this COP like holding our heads high or, or, or not? Hello. Thank you very much, Lauri, and um, uh, good, good morning also from my side to, to everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be part of this discussion. Um, well, you mentioned um, or you ended your presentation with, uh, with the political courage and, uh, and, and commitment point, and this, of course, is, uh, is of crucial importance. Like we've heard, we don't have an issue with the, with the abundance of knowledge, but we do have... Uh, issues still with um, uh, with action but still i would i would really tend to disagree with um, with the backsliding um, um, argument uh, because as european leaders have have made clear europe will not backslide 
Um, and uh, even, well, despite this radically changed geopolitical landscape um, and the, well, extremely challenging years uh, since 2019 when we presented the Green Deal, uh, the European Union well, has stayed, stayed the course and has managed to keep this integrated nature of the Green, Green Deal alive. Um, when the pandemic hit, uh, the European leaders decided to accelerate the Green Deal in all its dimensions and, uh, and use it um, to aid the economic recovery. And then, of course, came the Russia's brutal war of aggression against uh, Ukraine. Um, and again, the implementation of, um, of the Green Deal was accelerated in some parts and, and continued in, in all the others. Uh, you were mentioning the, um, the renewable energy energy story in Europe. Um, I would be a bit more optimistic on that front. Um, for example, this significantly reducing reliance on fossil fuels and, and speeding up the transition to green energy, it became a matter of European security now, next to being necessity for climate and environment. And, and in terms of progress that we have seen, it's really been quite uh, impressive. If we look at the years between 2021, 2023, uh, the combined wind and solar power capacity increased by 36 percent. Of course, one can argue that, you know, we have to look where we started from, but still 36 percent increase uh, within such, uh, such a short time frame is, uh, is remarkable. Uh, and, and if we look at the first half of, uh, of this year, then uh, the, the renewables generated already 50% of, um, of electricity in the EU. And the, the other example, because European Green Deal is an integrated whole and it's important to look at it in all its pillars, you mentioned the carbon tunnel and I think one of the biggest contributions of the Green Deal has been precisely to look beyond that uh, and connect different dots. Um, and, and during, the, um, uh, during the, the war, for example, Europe also agreed on certain um, well, radically important circular economy uh, policies, uh, for example, the eco-design uh, legislation, but also the Critical Raw Materials Act. Again, Europe increasingly realized that not only reliance on fossil fuels, uh, but also dependence on other raw materials from unreliable partners uh, poses a security risk. Um, uh, so this decoupling of uh, Europe's economic growth from resource use, increasing the use of recycled materials, diversifying uh, supply chains, it has become as important um, as ever. Uh, and, and the priority also in the eyes of the leaders has become higher than what it was in 2019 when the Green Deal uh, was, was presented. Um, and, and thirdly, I would also mention the, the landmark uh, nature restoration law, because this was also um, mentioned in the, in the Guardian article, for example. Uh, it is the first, uh, first of its kind in the world. It's crucial for food security, climate agenda. Um, and we know that, of course, it did face difficulties during the negotiations, to, to put it mildly. Uh, but it was agreed uh, during the summer, both by the European Parliament and, uh, and the EU member states. And it was agreed with, with high, high ambition. Uh, we are the first uh, let's say, continent in the world to have something like that. Um, and also globally, we have been pushing, we continue pushing for, uh, for similar high ambition on climate, on biodiversity, on pollution. Um, so, in short, I would just say that uh, despite these significant challenges since the 2019-2020, uh, the EU has stayed and, and will also continue staying on track. When we look at the strategic agenda for the European Union until 2029, that uh, all the European leaders agreed to this summer, and when we also then read it uh, together with the political guidelines and the mission letters that uh, President von der Leyen has um, given for the for the upcoming new commission, we can clearly see that implementing the Green Deal and, and delivering on the climate and, and biodiversity goals, they remain at the very heart of the EU priorities um, also for the upcoming policy cycle. Um, Maybe just a short note on the on the competitiveness point, because what we can also see sometimes is that uh, um, as if now the competitiveness is somehow um, 
in conflict, uh, the competitiveness focus is somehow in conflict with the, with the Green Deal uh, agenda. But it's it's clear that the green and climate neutral economy it also needs to become the most competitive version uh, version of economy, and and that is why one of the one of the Lions uh, priorities for the next period is to boost clean industries competitiveness and with a strong focus on well energy infrastructure technology circular economy and and next to that uh, she has also mentioned very strongly the food sustainability food security water nature um, with quite some emphasis on the on the climate adaptation side um, and thirdly what i think is very important and what we haven't touched upon too much uh, today is still the social side of it all, um, uh, ensuring a, a just transition when we are uh, shifting quite radically to a different type of uh, um, type type of economy. So, so I think overall we have taken very big steps over the um, over the past five years uh, on all in all these interconnected uh, strands of the of the Green Deal. Of course, a lot of work remains to be done. Uh, but still, given this uh, this progress that has been made, and also the the commitments that the European leaders who we have today have made for the next five years, we do have well every reason to to present a strong and and assertive stance at the at the upcoming triple COPs. Actually, we've mentioned climate biodiversity, and there is also going to be the desertification COP again. Everything interlinked, of course. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I, I will come back to some of the points you, you made later on. I'm noted down, but uh, I, I wanted to bring in uh, Kate, uh, you now, because uh, I mean, Helena was very optimistic that Europe is really delivering well and all the policies working, funding uh, is flowing. What's your impression having, having uh, both Kind of based on what you see from the audits and 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 your previous uh, previous experience as a minister as well, are, are, is Europe putting where money where the, the mouth is and and are we getting the results that we need? Well, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for for bringing all those people together and uh, and it's. Um, it be an honor to, to be part of, of that panel as well. Um, well, first, I would start with saying that, as also many um, previous speakers have, uh, have underlined, that the fighting the climate change, of course, is expensive. And nobody really, until now, uh, knows uh, how expensive it will be and how expensive it is. Uh, and there is a one nice and round estimation uh, that says, um, the EU alone uh, needs to spend one trillion a year every year until 2050 to um, to achieve net zero. Uh, this, of course, is not only public money; it combines uh, the EU member states as well as private money. But the number is still rather scary, I must say. Um, and um, in this light. Um, it might even be a bit uh, surprising uh, that I personally am currently less concerned um, on um, um, or with the amount of, of money we need and even a bit more concerned uh, with how we spend it. Uh, because if there is one thing that I have learned from my previous um, life um, in uh, while being a member of, of different governments and also while being a Minister of Finance, then this is uh, the fact that um, there is never enough money. And um, the appetite is always bigger um, and we could always use more funds for our priorities. But of course, there are always limits uh, to our spending power. Um, and exactly because the needs will be and already are really huge, um, I think we need to plan and execute extremely carefully to make sure that um, it's not just a goal, but in reality it would be also the same um, uh, thing that um, we get the maximum out of absolutely every euro we spend. And Quite frankly, I'm not entirely sure that we are doing it um, to the extent we should at the moment. 
Um, for example, uh, here in the Court of Auditors, uh, we have looked at the EU's climate and energy targets. And uh, we all know that EU reached um, its targets for 2020, which no doubt is extremely positive outcome. Uh, the EU also uh, has a pretty good overview um, of the sectors that contributed, um, or in fact, the sectors that did not contribute uh, to the extent um, uh, and, and contributed to achieving the targets. Uh, what we know much less at the moment is um, which measures really worked um, uh, the best and in most cost-effective uh, manner. And again, considering and knowing the massive need uh, that is there and that will be there, uh, this is exactly the kind of analysis uh, we, would, uh, we would need to know what works, what works a bit less and what doesn't work so that we would uh, be in a better position to make the decisions um, uh, where invest more uh, and, um, and what could bring um, uh, the needed result in the most cost-effective way. Um, and um, there is also a risk that uh, we see from here, from the European Court of Auditors, uh, that um, both the climate and the environmental measures become um, a kind of um, box ticking exercise uh, where it is more important um, to, uh, to show on paper uh, that something climate friendly was done and or, or the thing that was done is in fact climate friendly uh, rather than implementing a really um, complex and complicated projects and policies uh, that have real impact. Um, related to that, um, I think there is a tendency also to, um, to overestimate and over-report uh, climate impact. Um, at the uh, Code of Auditors, um, we have looked at the EU budget and also um, RRF, climate spending benchmarks. And uh, for example, um, railway projects currently have a climate coefficient of 100 percent. Now there is no doubt investment to railway is much more environmental and climate friendly uh, than in many other projects, um, uh, transport-wise projects. Um, and, um, and there is no doubt that uh, the investments are, are needed there. But still, um, 100 percent coefficient disregards the fact that most railways are still powered by fossil fuels and that building them, in fact, requires a um, considerable amount of uh, energy and resources. So this is just uh, one example. Um, overall, I think that uh, in EU we are much better and we are good at planning, but we are not really always assessing the, um, uh, the impact. Of course, uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, this is not an easy thing to do. Um, again, our special reports here in Court of Auditors show uh, that um, even information on climate spending is not fully reliable uh, always. And there is unfortunately still uh, little understanding how much the EU climate spending contributes to achieving um, our targets. Um, I have just finished my own uh, special report on organic farming to bring, bring you another example uh, where the focus of the policy uh, is more environmental um, rather than climate benefits. But again, the overall logic is, uh, is the same. The EU assumes that um, as we increase the organically farmed land, the organically uh, farmed area, um, we will, by default, also get the environmental benefits. In reality, we do not know what we have achieved uh, how, in, in, in environmental benefit uh, sense. Uh, when using uh, the 12 billion we have spent on the organic agriculture in recent years, um, and even if we wanted to measure it, or even if we wanted to measure the impact, uh, currently we have no tools fit for the task. Uh, for example, 
uh, the EU system that is currently in place for soil samples cannot really distinguish between the samples from organic and, and non-organic soil. So again, just um, another um, a small example. And just to to, to conclude uh, my um, uh, inter intro or, or um, uh, few few cents here, um, I absolutely realize that I might sound I may sound uh, quite critical, uh, but I also want to underline that uh, when we think and talk about the EU, it is fair and absolutely true that EU does many things well and often much better than many other countries in there, many other powers in the world. Um, and climate policy um, is a case in point. We have been world leaders uh, in this for decades and, uh, and this really deserves a recognition. So my criticism or European Code of Auditors criticism um, comes from a really constructive place. Um, it's not a criticism for a criticism, but it's really about improving further and getting the most out of uh, our money, not questioning the fundamental need uh, or principles of climate, climate policy at all. So um, I think EU is doing better and better, but there are still more um, to be done in a sense that uh, if we know that we have the limits for the resources, it makes it even more important uh, to, uh, to create um, not a fragmented system, uh, but a system where different pieces come together uh, and where we also can measure the results we get from the money uh, we spend and from the money we have. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I think the message is that I'm picking up here is that that really the transparency and uh, effectiveness of the financing matters. I, I guess, uh, Arnold, this resonates very much also with the negotiations around the climate financing at the COP level, because this is really at the core of like, not to spend money for the sake of spending money, but creating an actual impact and, and creating vehicles, uh, vehicles for that. Maybe could you, kind of inject a few comments or thoughts here, Arnold, around that, to think we will be making progress on that. What, what do you see as a key, key kind of next steps, how to create this transparency in a climate finance and, and, and bring accountability and trust to see a signs of progress there? Laurie, I think that's, uh, you know, what's uh, being negotiated uh, feverishly at the moment. Um, so I would certainly not have not have all the answers, but I'm quite optimistic that uh, that we will have uh, an outcome at, uh, at COP29. Um, but I would um, I would echo what uh, just has been said, right? We need uh, the different institutions uh, also play play a greater role in evaluating this uh, this finance in question right? because so far asking for more money alone has not uh, has not given us the required resources and we need to uh, you know as uh, as has been said we need to also evaluate uh, where this investment makes uh, most uh, sense right and then we need to look at uh, you know, also the biggest, uh, the biggest emitters in the field of climate change. We need to look at, uh, at the subsidies, right, which also play a key part. But uh, where I think we have no alternative uh, to, to increasing the resources is to make sure uh, that uh, developing countries have uh, the resources to, to adapt uh, to the impacts of climate change. I think that's, uh, that's almost a moral uh, obligation for the international community. Right. And uh, but also there, um, you know, this um, this accountability for action needs to be sort of sort of mainstreamed. Um, I know, Larry, maybe I've not uh, not given you the the, the clear cut answer. But, uh, uh, you know, as I said, this is uh, this is a hot topic uh, at the moment that uh, we will have to wait and see where this lands at, uh, at COP29. Uh, is a safe space you can just wing it and have your personal personal takes here it's only published online don't worry 
Okay, but uh, since I see uh, Yordanka has managed to reconnect, I will now use the opportunity that we have the connection working and, and Yordanka bring you in as well. You already kind of outlined uh, uh, many of the challenges that that uh, war in Ukraine uh, has brought into your region and your country and how you're struggling and, and building momentum. But I wanted to a little bit like dig deeper uh, and, and bring, because what we see, it seems to me, are like two conflicting forces. On one side, it seems at the, some rhetorical level and policy level, Europe is becoming more protectionist. Countries are a little bit less trusting, trying to build their own domestic, you know, whether it's uh, whether it's you know uh, manufacturing the clean tech solutions or renewable energy, and that the reliance on the neighbors, interconnectors, this is a little bit hesitation, like a, a national isolation. Isolistic thinking, but on the other hand, we see, but it's also coming together. How do you see it, like from from a Moldovan perspective? Which which forces are greater, like the ones pulling us apart or the ones putting us kind of collaborating? Which forces are bigger, and and what to estimate? What what are the most crucial uh, kind of types of support and cooperation that Moldova needs right now? Ah, it seems that we have lost uh, Yartanka, unfortunately. Yeah. But hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, ah. I'm, I'm okay. back. Do you hear okay. me? Okay, okay, okay. Yes, we can hear you. So, super. Maybe. So, I'll follow up for your question. Very important. Maybe it's very important at this moment. You could turn off the camera and, and the technical support can put your picture at least. Yes, I can do this. So, um, just in case. Okay. Yes, uh, let's do it like this. So, indeed, it's very important at this moment to understand what is better for us. Uh, from my personal perspective and the way how Republic of Moldova is developing the relation at this uh, moment is the fact that we are indeed are struggling to be in uh, cooperation with the neighbors and especially with the countries from European Union. And this is, uh, as I mentioned, not because we would like to be part of European Union, but also because we are, do understand that it's, uh, for us it's important to have uh, a strong lessons learned from uh, uh, partners and also to have the common understanding and common actions on uh, on different environmental climate and the biodiversity activities uh, so moldova can advocate and uh, for sure can increase financial commitments in this case from the european uh, union and uh, especially to uh, to uh, reduce the vulnerability of the country on uh, climate issue and biodiversity loss, and also to take in consideration the geopolitical uh, situation and uh, also to to uh, fight for uh, and to co communicate and to fight for different uh, interests with the field of uh, 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 environmental development and uh, recovery. So it's very important at this uh, moment for Moldova, especially to start the developing of self-sufficient capacities uh, uh, in uh, environmental issues. Especially on to think implement the uh, targeted uh, budgeting based on with support of partners and working to with the neighbors countries. And here it's important for us to understand news from ETS and how to form how to create the ETS and what has been the carbon pricing and how to work on the carbon price. and for sure such kind of approaches and uh, self-development and uh, new policy new reforms will not be possible to be implemented in 
discussing uh, finding the best solutions for Moldova and for neighbors countries now it is a priority so uh, uh, Moldova being a vulnerable country uh, need to uh, block uh, and to develop the financial mechanism and to be involved in the developing of the financial mechanism and also in the same time to be a part of uh, uh, have possibility to uh, uh, use and also to contribute to the financial mechanism and also to moldova for moldova it's important at this moment uh, to have the capacity and on the uh, transfer of technologies, innovations, and also to work with uh, researchers, with scientists, uh, with ac academia. Because, uh, uh, you know, isolating, as uh, you, Lauri, mentioned, this is not the solution. Moldova not uh, is only a vulnerable country, but Moldova has a lot, uh, it is a country with, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, not having in the past environment as a priority. So now we only uh, raise the importance of environment, climate issue on a higher level. And uh, we understand that we need to have this uh, cooperation, communication internally, but also externally with the partners and with the uh, uh, country. So uh, advocating for tailored financial solutions like uh, the Lost and Damaged Fund uh, at the uh, global uh, platform, it's uh, also a possibility for Moldova to play a role on this and also to, uh, to be part and to, uh, uh, to put uh, the accent. Uh, being in position of the ministry, just just uh, to, to explain you, uh, I had this uh, debate with a lot of my colleagues uh, internally in the country and also with the uh, other ministers uh, that uh, we need to have so-called the environmental climate uh, diplomacy. So we need to learn how correctly present uh, the country, what is mean the vulnerability in the process of negotiation and how correctly uh, to use uh, the vulnerability aspects, but in the same time to know what to exactly, what is our interest, what is our ambition and to have clear steps how to achieve such kind of ambitions. And I am totally agree with you that uh, the new uh, generation of uh, uh, national determinated contribution should be uh, uh, more uh, targeted and more ambitious. And uh, in this case, when we will have clear targets, we will have clear measures, actions, how to achieve such kind of targets. So uh, indeed, it is important for Moldova even if it's vulnerable to climate change country, even if it's affected uh, by the war, not to leave the hands down, but to stay straight, to think very uh, uh, straight and to have clear understanding what we can do, with whom we are working, with whom we are following uh, the ideas, approaches, mechanism, processes, and uh, to, to achieve uh, the a good uh, uh, development for the country and uh, recover, conservate the environment. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I would open a discussion for everyone, and also I would invite uh, people uh, uh, who have been listening in to use the Q&A button and maybe submit your questions there, should you have them. But, but uh, my broader question, and here anyone can just uh, signal and, and take the lead, is that um, uh, still, what to do with that uh, implementation gap? Like, uh, what should be done at, let's say, what can be done at national level? What should be done at the EU level? What should be done at international level? You know, who, you know, what can UNAP do? What can Code of Audit as well? What can Commission do more in supporting this transition? Um, yeah. More of an open question. Do I see a volunteer in the panel? Eight, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, well, 
what we are doing here in Board of Auditors is that we are, um, um, or a part of our job is to see if the, the, the goals and the policies are really, or how they are translating in, in real life uh, projects and real life changes. And um, again, I come back uh, to the uh, to the previous period where we reached its um, uh, climate targets. I think what is really um, again important there is to have a follow up as well to know what works, what doesn't work. And as we have already um, uh, uh, bringing it uh, up here, also from from previous speakers, it's of course it's also important to to find a fix where things are not working well, but it's also important to focus to, the, um, uh, to these um, um, angles that bring the results. And if we don't know what brings the result, it's really difficult to do it. So uh, I think this is, uh, this is uh, one part of it. Another part is maybe um, um, the overall um, situation with the bankable projects. Because, uh, and again, if I compare it to the situation where the, we were, let's say, 15 years ago, 12 years ago, 10 years ago, when I was also still the Minister of Environment, I think we are in a much better position right now. But still, in a much better position does not necessarily mean that there's nothing more we can do. Currently, there is, in addition to EU budget and RRF also invest EU, there is EIB, the appetite of private climate investments has clearly increased. If you look at the um, global energy investment numbers, then the green energy investment is almost twice as large now as the investment um, to, to fossil fuels. Um, but again, this is of course still not where we want to be. Um, but comparing to 2019, the fossil and green investments were still almost equal. Now the difference is um, uh, twice. Coming to the EU point of view, I think sometimes our problem is not uh, the lack of instruments, but really an abundance of them. There are so many and too many different instruments. And uh, again, when it comes to the funding, the funding is extremely uh, fragmented. And I see that this makes um, it difficult both for, for the people who need the money, as well as for the people who have uh, to make policies and uh, target the money. Uh, I'm currently working on a, on a special report on critical raw materials. And uh, we have been trying to figure out how much EU money is channeled into this extremely important topic. Um, and, and this has been very difficult uh, because uh, there are very many different funding channels, but there is no good and precise um, overview of, um, of all the different um, um, different aspects and all the different um, channels that are there and all the different decisions that have been made. Uh, and in this context, I do think that overall the direction that uh, the Commission, European Commission now seems um, to have to consolidate and, um, and um, simplify uh, the funding, I think it seems very reasonable. Uh, Today, there are tens of EU spending programs uh, that, uh, that are there. And uh, the fragmentation is also a problem for capital markets. Uh, I think it was also uh, pointed out uh, in, in the uh, recent Draghi report, um, the markets are, are not functioning opti um, optimally uh, either. Um, there is a lot that can be done uh, that can be done by the EU there, uh, also to reduce the fragmentation and, and the rigidity of the system. So this is one thing, if you, if you ask Laurie, what, what can be done more? Um, and when I'm still thinking about, uh, again, that, that those bankable projects, um, I think we are constantly becoming better uh, at preparing robust pro projects. Um, but as there are so many of them that we need, um, uh, it's, uh, it's also uh, true that sometimes the amount of projects uh, probably will be and can become a, a bottleneck as well. Uh, when we were working with the um, recent work on REITs here in the European Court of Auditors, um, the German authorities, for example, told us that um, they uh, have um, simplified uh, the permitting rules. Um, the, 
they have a streamlined, streamlined permitting rules, but there simply will be and are so many projects uh, that authorities uh, still can be uh, and can become a bottleneck. So I think this is a never ending question of how, how we can get rid of those bottlenecks and how we can uh, put, place, put in place the rules uh, that are necessary, but not more. So this is also uh, another uh, way to, to look at. But uh, yeah, again, sorry for being maybe a bit too long, but this is, uh, I think the, the fragmentation is currently a problem and to get rid of the fragmentation um, and also to, to keep in mind that um, uh, the bottlenecks um, uh, are constantly worked on and also analyzing uh, the previous period so that we would know what works, what doesn't work and focusing on what really works. I think these are uh, things that can still be um, improved a bit. And I don't know, maybe a, a kind of 30 second uh, kind of answer from you. Has UNEP kind of changed somehow the focus or how you work kind of to focus and hone in into this implementation gap? Uh, are you trying to support countries? What, what are your main kind of mechanisms that you are using for that? In 30 seconds, that's uh, one of our key mandates as UNEP uh, to support countries in the implementation of uh, multilateral environmental agreements. Uh, we host uh, 15 uh, secretariats within UNEP, uh, the CBD for instance, not uh, climate change, not the certification. But we, of course, work very closely with those secretariats as well, uh, whether it's environmental law, whether it's capacity building. And uh, in that context, uh, since uh, this is an SEI meeting and we have an auditor also on the panel, a few years ago, we also looked at, you know, with the help of SEI and uh, the, the auditing community uh, into SI in this case, and, uh, and it was... Uh, the, the National Audit Office of, of Estonia, but also uh, Tanzania, looked at these two countries uh, to uh, maybe find metrics that could us help what Kate has said to uh, figure out what works, what doesn't work in a very transparent uh, fashion, right? Uh, facilitating also a bit more of a whole of society approach when it comes to ME implementation, that it's not just one focal point in the ministry that is responsible for ME implementation, but it becomes a societal uh, issue because we are, have much more better data and clarity on the societal economic benefits, but also perhaps cost of the implementation, uh, which would allow uh, to facilitate uh, this becoming much more of a societal issue. Okay, but I see that unfortunately we are running out of time, not running out of topics. So I would quick fire last question, uh, yes or no answer. Do you think this will be the most successful COP that we have had? Helena. <laughs> yes, this, this is not, uh, not something I would like to speculate at the moment. If you allow me, I will just make a couple of remarks on the previous, um, uh, previous point, mm. because I think it's very important what was also uh, emphasized by um, by Kate in, in, in both interventions and of course this um, well simplification and, and streamlining of the funding instruments it, it will be key um, and also monitoring and evaluation to make it more more granular both are very important and the commission has now also mm, well acknowledged that the only let's say there is a small discrepancy between the two because on the one hand we want the uh, funding and finance to re, uh, reach the uh, recipients uh, quicker. We want it to be more more effective uh, and avoid bureaucratic hurdles. And at the same time, when we do uh, increase the granularity of the, of the monitoring and reporting, we somehow have to avoid that it becomes a, well, an additional bureaucratic monster. So to design it uh, well enough that it delivers kind of on, on both objectives, I think this has been in um, in several fields, a bit of a, a bit of a challenge, but it's definitely something that uh, that the commission is um, is intending to focus quite a lot on. And maybe the other thing that I I would mention is what was also at the very beginning in the um, it, it, or in the in the first um, uh, presentation is that you know the the climate mitigation somehow has not or the biodiversity loss action has not. Um, 
uh, being as active as, as action on climate. And, and this is extremely important. And next to the kind of the public financing uh, instruments uh, and public finance that we have to increase and the private finance that we have to increase, we also need to focus on, on new business models. And that's why, for example, nature credits is something that um, President von der Leyen has now emphasized as one of the upcoming uh, key priorities. We have also agreed on the carbon uh, removal certification uh, recently at the EU level to really create this business case also for biodiversity. For carbon, it has been quite clear. You have um, renewable energy technologies, uh, transportation uh, technologies, things that you can make money with, uh, with the transition when it comes to nature and biodiversity, it has been much more much more complex. So also to fill the implementation gap, creating these new business models and, and making protection and restoration of nature also make economic sense for operators, uh, that, will be, that will be crucial. And, and for the COPs, we can see that increasingly there is an alignment and um, out of silos thinking between the climate, biodiversity and uh, and pollution. So this is this is important. Hopefully, it will be strengthened also this time around. Okay, thank you, Helena. Didn't uh, give in to the provocation, but I see that we have one minute left. I will try to perhaps then make a one minute reflection or some of what we've uh, covered and heard. My impression is that uh, that yes, challenges are gigantic uh, environmental challenges, uh, the, the conflict, geopolitical tensions, economic uh, tensions and rivalries. These are forces, you know, pushing slightly as a part, but my impression is that there are so much more forces uh, bringing us together as well. And there's a need for us to come together and work together to solve those issues. Then what I also, heard is that mo mostly and for first and foremost we should focus now really on the implementation and you know provide insights and work on understanding what does deliver us results how can we build the uh, let's say the the context and the circumstances that uh, the right investments and right actions and policies uh, can be implemented and, and flourish. And then also I had the impression that, uh, that even though there are the rivalries and uh, tensions between uh, big economic powers, Europe will uh, and, and wants to be the trusted partner and be not only a force on its own, but a force to work with and collaborate with as well uh, to solve all those uh, uh, difficult issues in the future. And, and then also the hopeful message that science and research can help us to navigate and find solutions and intermediate. With that, I would really like to thank all the speakers and panelists and all the participants Thank you so much. Uh, the recording of this event will be also made uh, available online and the presentations, so you can uh, listen and tune in later if you should uh, want. And hopefully we will keep in uh, contact and we will keep on working together uh, in the future as well. So thank you very much and I wish everyone a nice day. <laughs>